someone please rise? Our reading comes from John 6, 1 through 13. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is the Sea of Tiberias. And a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had, already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, It would take more than half of a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, Have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to the disciples, Gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. The word of the Lord for the people of the Lord. Praise be to God. I always like to go directly from the passage to basically my sermon, but I forgot to say something that's really important. We put an insert in your bulletin once again this, this week like we did last week. I meant to do this during the children's moment. We got quite a few responses, but we need more responses. So if you can help us by being a, a volunteer to go back one Sunday a month or maybe even less if we get enough volunteers to help with the children's church. So you'll be in here most of the time. If you can help by providing a meal for the youth or if you can help by doing one of the children's moments uh, before the children leave, please mark on that sheet and put it in the collection plate along with the connection card in just a few minutes. Okay? Thank you. All right, before we begin, let's pray once again. Father, we thank you for this moment, this time, and we pray like we do every week. Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Oh, Lord, you are our strength and our Redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. I think you'd probably agree with me that some of the most memorable and positive experiences in our lives have to do with eating. Yeah. <laughs> the right combination of food and company can make all the difference. I know that's a, 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 a generalization, but isn't that true? Think about that in your own life. Reflect back on your life. I mean, seriously, how many good times can you actually remember with friends when all you did was get together, but there was no food? Not many, I bet. But just as true, think of any amazing meal that you've had somewhere. The food was incredible, and most likely you were with someone else and that made all the difference that made the occasion memorable how uh, appropriate today as we look at this story from the gospels that we're having a potluck lunch after church we're going to eat together there's something about that that's important and today's story that we read from the gospel of john it's one of those kind of stories about people eating together and how important it was and in case you didn't already know this this is the only miracle that Jesus did that's found in all four Gospels. And it's about eating with Jesus. It's about being fed by God. It's about helping God serve that food to others. And so the feeding of the 5,000 may be the most well-known of all of Jesus' miracles. 
And you have to admit, it's pretty amazing to feed a massive crowd with only five loaves of bread and a couple of fish. And John does a great job setting up the story for us. He wants us to make sure that we get certain details fixed in our minds so that we understand the full meaning of this miracle. And the first four verses set the stage for us. There they are again. In verse 1, John tells us that the story takes place by the Sea of Galilee, up in northern Israel. A place in Israel where nearly everybody made their living from either farming or fishing. And if you lived in Jerusalem down south, you would have thought of Galileans as people who lived in the boonies, so to speak. The people there are common people. They're rural people. To be honest, it's, it may be similar to the way many people in San, San Antonio think of us here in Bolverde and Spring Branch. And so verse 1 gives us that setting. Verse 2 tells us that a crowd is following Jesus and growing all the time. These people have basic needs in their life and they are finding out that Jesus can meet those needs. Like health. Jesus heals people. But they also have this crowd mentality because Jesus is unusual. Jesus is different. He's not weird but he's peculiar in a sense. He's different. He does strange, miraculous things. And they like to watch. So according to John, what he talks about and what he says about these people, don't get the impression that they've come to Jesus to find out about the deeper mysteries of life or get some spiritual depth. And then in verse 3, John says that Jesus went up on the mountain and there he sat down with his disciples. Now that phrase may not mean a whole lot to us, but that would have meant something special to the Jewish person reading John's account. Think about it. What else happened on a mountain in Jewish history? Well, God spoke to Moses in the burning bush and sent him to save the people of Israel. And once again in that story, God gave Moses the Ten Commandments on a mountain. So when John says Jesus went up to a mountain, he wants to let you know something important is about to happen. He wants to compare him with Moses. Jesus is about to do something that saves people. And John mentioning that Jesus sat down was also significant. I mean, we often think of teachers standing up. That's what I do when I preach. That's what I do in my Bible study. I stand up. But a Jewish rabbi would always sit when he was teaching. And then the fourth verse tells us succinctly that Passover was near. And so part of the reason there's a big crowd there that day is it was a, it was a national holiday. What happens at Passover? Well, the Jewish people celebrate their release from slavery. A lamb is sacrificed. They gather their families and they share a simple meal together made up of food that reminds them of their past slavery, but also it's a celebration of their freedom from slavery. It's a feast time. They rejoice that God brought them out of Egypt. So for early Christians reading John's Gospel, John is saying, look at what is happening when you have Jesus with you. That's the Christian Passover. It's a meal shared by everyone with Jesus at the center. Jesus is the Passover lamb himself, leading us out of our slavery to sin, leading us to a new life. And so our Passover meal is usually called what? What do we call it? Communion, the Lord's Supper, gathering around the Lord's table. So we, we invite people, come to the table, because everyone who believes, if they believe, there is enough for everybody, no matter who they are. With Jesus at the center of the meal, there will even be leftovers, according to the story. If you have faith in Jesus, 
If you let God use what you got, there will be more than enough to go around with plenty to spare. Even, even though the story is about a miracle concerning food, we're not just talking about food here. So here's this incredibly huge crowd, and it's feast time. And so Jesus, if you remember the story we just read, he turns to Philip and he says, how are we going to buy bread so that these people can have something to eat? And so Philip doesn't like that question. He feels overwhelmed. What do you, what do you mean, Jesus? We have to feed these people? Uh, who do you think we are? Warren Buffett? Bill Gates? Mark Cuban? It would take several months for us to earn enough to even give everyone in this crowd just a little bite of food, much less a meal that's filling. I mean, Jesus, we didn't ask them to come out here. They can take care of themselves. Why do we have to give them anything? And so Philip, in this exchange, he looks at the need of all these people and then he looks at his resources and he decides the need is too much. The need is too great. There's too much disparity between what they, the disciples, have and what the crowd, the multitude surrounding them needs. So here's the basic question Jesus is asking Philip. And did you notice also, it's kind of uh, funny, the editorial comment that John makes in telling this story when he, he says, Jesus asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. <laughs> he just wanted to see Philip's perception on things. So here's the question that we need to ask ourselves and with Hill Country as a church, as individuals. When you see a need, will you respond out of a sense of scarcity or will you respond out of a sense of abundance? Would you categorize the quandary as an issue between us and them? Because that's the way Philip tended to view this issue. So whether out of faith or out of folly, Andrew, one of the other disciples, presents a boy to Jesus who has five small loaves of bread and two fish. Five small loaves of bread, two fish, 5,000 people. That's it. And you know what happens next. The bottom line is this. A little becomes a lot in the hands of Jesus. Jesus. If it just depends on us, scarcity. If it all depends on Jesus, abundance. We've probably all asked the question personally in our lives before, what difference can anything I do make to somebody else's life? And really, if we're realistic, there are very few of us who can make a very big difference in somebody else's life. But this story illustrates what happens when God takes what seems to be very little and turns it into something incredibly overflowing. There was a meal, only enough for one. But they underestimated God. In the hands of Jesus, what was given out of a spirit of generosity, a little boy who willingly gave what little he had, was taken and blessed and fed 4,999 more than it had been prepared for. God is able to take an apparently inadequate response and use it in a way that defies human understanding. The young boy could so easily have reasoned that his loaves and his fishes could achieve nothing among so many. But he didn't do that. 
Instead, he offered it to Jesus. It may seem many times to us that we, just like this little boy, have very little to offer Jesus. But if we offer what we have to Jesus, however little it is, he will do great things with us and in us and through us. I want to say two things about that through two stories. I read pretty recently about a lady named Jane, very successful lady as far as finances, as far as jobs. She was a market trader. She left for work early in the morning every morning, and one morning she had a head-on collision with a young man in another car, and she suffered massive, massive injuries. She wasn't expected to survive even. Her family prayed for her. Her church prayed for her. And gradually, she began to recover. But as she did, she still experienced many, many setbacks, had numerous operations. She was in constant pain. And when her pastor would visit her, she would say, Jesus bought, brought me through this. What can I do in return for him? And her pastor really didn't even know how to answer that question. But she found her own way of responding to Jesus. She found her own five loaves and two fish. Everyone who visited her to pray, she would pray for them. She would ask them who they wanted prayer for. And that's what she did. She even brought those holding crosses. Have you seen that you can hold in your hand if, you, if you're going through a time of stress or anxiety? She bought holding crosses and she gave them to all the nurses and all the doctors and all the, the cleaners and all the casual visitors that came to her room. Everyone got one. And here's what she said. I am so grateful for what Jesus has done for me. I can't do a lot, but I can do this. That was Jane's gift. And Jesus took what she had and blessed it and multiplied it. And many were blessed beyond measure. But, but here's the rub. We won't always know when God has used us to bless somebody else. Sometimes all of our labor of love, all of our work for the kingdom will seem to us almost worthless. We won't see the results we had hoped for. In his book, Fresh Power, Jim Cimbala tells the story of a couple from Sweden, two Swedish missionaries named David and Zve Flood, who went to the Congo in Africa. They felt called to the Congo to be missionaries to share the gospel in 1921. And they went to a remote village, but the chief would not allow them to come into the village or even speak to anybody. But they decided not to give up, so they built a hut just a short distance away. And the chief allowed only one little boy to take chicken and eggs to them twice a week. A lot of time went by and many prayers were lifted to God, but the only person in the village that they were ever allowed to speak to was this one little boy. But this little boy did become a believer in Christ. In time, Zve, the wife, became pregnant and gave birth to a little girl who they named Ina. But the mother, having been weakened by malaria, died a few weeks later. And David became enraged with God that he would bring so much suffering upon him and have absolutely nothing come from it. They had given their lives to go to Africa. There had been no fruit really from it at all. And now his wife is dead. And so he returned to the mission center where he left his infant daughter with another missionary couple. And he returned to Sweden and he spent his life angry and bitter towards God with a bottle by his side. Ina, on the meantime, in the meantime, was raised by this couple who returned to America a few years after 
this event. And she married and she settled in Seattle where she happened to come upon, I guess in a library somewhere, a Swedish missionary magazine that had a picture of her mother's grave in Africa. And unable to read the Swedish magazine, she had a college professor translate it for her. The little boy who had become a believer in Christ through the seemingly fruitless efforts of her parents had grown up and built a school in the village. And the Holy Spirit worked through him to bring faith to the children of the school and through the children of the school to bring their parents to faith in Jesus Christ. And the whole village of 600 worshipped the one true God and eventually many, many more in the surrounding area. Ina eventually met that boy who had delivered chickens to her parents at an evangelism conference. He was now the head of the Christian church body in the nation of Zaire, which is what Congo became named later, representing over 100,000 believers. See what God can do? He took the apparent failure of a young couple and created his church strong and vibrant where once there was none. Our story is about loaves and fishes using just a few chickens and some eggs. God fed an entire nation with his word. Ina was able to locate and visit with her father in Sweden just weeks before he died. And she told him that his life had not been in vain after all. That God had used his efforts to do wonderful things. Father, she said, see what God has done. And the bitterness and the anger that had overwhelmed him for so long melted away into the dark night. And David Flood was once again able to rejoice in the Lord. You know, the people that day who ate loaves and fishes probably didn't see what Jesus had done for them. I mean, there's 5,000. They don't all have a clear view. They were just happy to have a meal. David Flood became terribly discouraged because he didn't see, he couldn't see what God was doing through him. God works through the people who trust in him, but often... God leaves us in the dark about the results. We probably already feel inadequate to serve God. And when we finally work up the courage to act, we get easily discouraged when God doesn't allow us to see the results. But if we trust in God, if we allow His power to flow through us, He can do great things. It's not about what we can do. It's about what God can do working through us. So I encourage you today. See what God can do through you. Throw away your fear of failure because God is powerful even if you are weak. Rid yourself of the frustration of not seeing the fruit of your efforts because God works in unseen ways. He's working behind the scenes. We may not ever, ever know what God has done when we plant a seed, when we cultivate. Don't get frustrated. Don't give up. Don't see through the eyes of scarcity. See through the eyes of abundance. See what God can do in you and with you and through you. Let's pray. Father, I know in my own life, I have a tendency to look at things through scarcity instead of abundance. You say very clearly in your word that your resources are unlimited and unimaginable. 
and beyond what we can even think or comprehend. And yet we look at things that happen around us and things regarding the church sometimes perhaps and we, we say, well, we can't do that. We can't do that. And then sometimes, Lord, we attempt to do things with you and for you and actually even let you work through us and then we don't see any results and we think nothing's happened. But that's a lie. And that's what Satan would like to have us believe because it makes us get discouraged. Help us, Lord, to trust even when we don't see the outcomes. That if we're trusting you, we're depending on you, we're asking you to flow through us, we're asking you to use us, that you're doing that. And if we're obedient, if we listen to your spirit, and we walk out in faith, and we do what we sense you're telling us to do, you will bless that even when we don't see it. I pray all of that in the strong name of your son Jesus and for his sake. Amen.